everyone, it's Allison Mondell, director of AM Medieval Music. Welcome on this Feast of St. Ursula, October 21st, to our first community sing of the season. And I'm, I'm full of humble joy <laughs> to be here today. And I'm just going to um, pull my name up there. If you're tuning in, can you please do me a great favor and say hi and let me know where you are located and where you're where you're watching from. That would be so wonderful. Um, it's something I think that it's really important in a virtual environment like this to be able to connect with you directly. So I do that intentionally, but it's great to know that you're there too. And I'm going to just let this stream go for a little while and let some other people join in from wherever they are. And sometimes that takes some time. So here I'm in Acton, Massachusetts in the States. Uh, I recently moved recently as in last year from the DC area to the Boston area. And I um, have been honestly having an interesting time. <laughs> so it's, it feels almost like a homecoming to come back online and to talk and teach and sing this work of Hildegard of Bingen today. So the item, this particular piece that we're looking at today on our community sing, <clears throat> is has just been released released as a new transcription and that is favus distillans responsory for saint ursula so if you're just joining welcome welcome please say hi in the chat and let me know where you're tuning in from i'd love to hear from you and I am going to pop the link in the chat for you to go ahead I'm going to give you the direct link to the PDF for this piece. We're looking at Favus Distillans, a responsory for St. Ursula. So in our community sing today, what the plan is, is to, I'm going to just give you a little bit of background around the piece, around St. Ursula. And I want to then work our way through the piece and we'll alternate singing. And as we go, I also want to just sort of highlight some of the interesting is an understatement, um, layered, complex, completely marvelous sort of gifts that are embedded in the lines of this song. So there are things musically, textually or poetically, scripturally to sort of bring our awareness to. But one of the real primary um, intentions that I have for my own singing, for my own artistry, but absolutely for my own teaching is to, hi Sherry, is so glad you're here, is to share ways in which we can actually take this music off of the page and off of, honestly, off of a pedestal and use it to inform our, ourself, our own living. And that's a beautiful gift. And that's a gift that is sort of something that evolves over time. But if we can even plant a few seeds for that today, I, I, I hope we're able to do that for you today. So what I want to do is, you know, just take a moment to get your piece you're going to want that. It's three pages plus a translation page. And I'm going to ask you just to take a moment um, to just find a, a sort of settled place internally. I get, I get really amped up and sort of my energy gets really sort of heightened and uh, sort of excited. It's not nerves, it's energy. <laughs> so it really helps what I do is I bring my awareness to my heart and I feel my energy ground into the earth. 
And I feel my whole spine respond in response. That sounds very Hildegardian, responding response. That <laughs> sort of informs this piece today too. So the, the nature of this piece, let me just talk a moment about St. Ursula. There was a really rampant cult that came up, a cult as in uh, a sort of a, an explosion of interest and devotional energy to St. Ursula and her 11,000 virgin companions in the 12th century. Um, the way the legend goes is that, and, and you know, we think of this as legend, whether it's historical or symbolic, these two things kind of commingle. St. Ursula was a maiden. She's believed to be a, a princess of uh, the sort of uh, British Isles. And her father was a pagan. And she had become a Christian and devoted herself to Christ. As the legend goes, she was pledged to a man in marriage by her father who was a, not a Christian, Ursula begged her father to go on a pilgrimage for three years. And the pilgrimage was going into the Holy Land to, to Rome. Now, along the way, <clears throat> maidens came, maidens upon maidens upon maidens came. Now, whether or not Ursula had 11 companions that then brought 1,000 companions, or it's really, it's just sort of the shreds of time. We don't know. Hi, oh, hi Monica. So glad you're here. Um, but as it, as it went, the, the group grew and grew and grew to this multitude of virgins. And there was um, a great grave site that was found in an excavation in the, I believe it was, possibly the 11th century, where it was possibly a Roman burial ground um, in and around Cologne. So the maidens, Ursula and the maidens, came across the mainlands, the continents, and when they got to Cologne, they met Attila the Hun. And Attila the Hun uh, basically told Ursula to come and be his wife or concubine or consort it's not clear exactly and he would spare her life and the life of all the women and their other companions and she refused and they they were all martyred there by the huns it's a devastating story it's something that you know we can see many archetypal layers in that story but it really caught fire. It lit the imagination of those in and around Cologne and those areas of, of the Holy Roman Empire at that time. And Hildegard's very good friend and her protege, Elizabeth of Schonau, was sort of asked as, a, as another visionary herself to spread some light on the historical, you know, connection of Ursula and this grave site. Well, Hildegard, this is most relevant today, really sort of, her eye was really quite caught by Ursula, this legend, but most importantly, this sort of symbolic or archetypal um, themes that Ursula embodied, specifically virginity. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit in more detail. Uh, what I, this is a personal gloss, what I see as a, a personal devotional autonomy, virgins, you know, that which is chaste and pure, but also that which is dedicated to Christ, the bridegroom. And I also see this courage and this tenacity and this um, real dedication that Ursula brought. <clears throat> And that Ursula inspired in all of these other followers. 
<laughs> so we have, you know, Hildegard the leader, uh, who's not only, you know, in her own leadership role, trying to understand and embody these principles, um, but also Hildegard the teacher and the mother, who is also trying to impress these virtues upon her own flock. So there's some interesting layers here, and this is sort of just a, a sort of a, a background, an entree into the legend. Now today, October 21st, is what we call the feast. And this is in the Catholic um, uh, calendar where we would honor a particular saint on a day of significance. And this happens to be the feast of Saint Ursula. So I see that, I, you know, I'm not a practicing Catholic, but I do take feast days very seriously. This special energy of really acknowledging something really beautiful and important and sacred. So this responsory, this particular form, <clears throat> let's talk about this. This piece is an old friend. It's, it's something in its liturgical form as a responsory has specific Form. And you're going to see in the score, you're going to see the letter R with a colon, and you're going to see a letter V with a colon. Now, a responsory has several sections, okay? And there's several times, you know, throughout a monastic a day. Hildegard was part of a convent, so there was sort of following a specific liturgy at a specific time of day. Now, for the Feast of St. Ursula, there would have been many songs, many chants, and many liturgical items that would have been key to that day, depending on what time of day. So here we have a responsory. It's a sort of more elongated form. And the way it's composed is giving us a lot of space. A lot of space not to just um, get text out but a lot of space to be inside a word. Um, Hildegard talks about uh, the term ruminatio to, in, in, in order to ruminate or chew like cud on something and she talks about these very very long melismatic passages that are in this piece. It's sort of it's sort of it, it sort of entering into that, that process of ruminatio. I want to take that further because not only are we listening, but we are in the moment of the song, of the word, of this experience. <clears throat> so that said, we're going to start to dive into this piece and let me know if you have any questions. One really, really important thing I want everybody to know right away. This piece is composed in um, with a final of A. However, I know most of us do not have a lot of easy comfort with these high ranges. So you have you don't need my permission, but I'm giving you full permission to move any of these songs to where they may suit you best, okay? Pitch was absolutely relative, okay? So I'm taking this a full fourth down. So normally this would be A, but we're going down, I'm putting this, so E is our final, or basically where A would be E. So we have something right here which is just going to give us a more relaxed treatment. <laughs> okay, a more relaxed treatment. <clears throat> that said, I'm just gonna grab a, a sip of water here. Let's dive into this text because this is where it gets really interesting. <laughs> And really fun, right? So, <clears throat> I wanted to bring out <clears throat> this wonderful copy, this wonderful book, The Song of Songs, a translation by Ariel Block and Hannah Block. 
So I've had this book for a while. It's wonderful. Why is it wonderful? Because it's a new translation from the original Hebrew, and I think this is all going to be backwards, but I want to show it to you. So we have the Hebrew and this new English translation. And I wanted to just share with you, as we look into this opening uh, response, so the first R of the colon is called the response. Favus distillans. Favus is a honeycomb. Distillans is dripping, right? So then we come to this exquisite section. I'm just going to read the text of the first response. Follow along. Favus distillans, Ursula virgo fuit, que anium dei amplecti desideravit. Mel et lac. Sublingua eius. And as you look at your translation, a dripping honeycomb was Ursula, the young woman who honey, mel, et lac, and milk under her tongue longed to enfold the Lamb of God. And here the blocks say, this is Song of Songs, verse 4, line 11, or section 4, line 11. Your lips are honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue. Your clothes hold the scent of Lebanon. And this hello to everyone who's just joining. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. So here we have this really wonderful paradox. And this is something that's so exciting as an artist and as a person. And it's going to stretch us. We have this erotic song that is not <clears throat> just about carnal pleasure. This is eros, this highest love of a bride and a bridegroom. And as we see Hildegard with so much uh, sort of understanding of the closeness of God and this desire of a bride or a virgin to become united or sort of conjoined, a conjunctio, in a sort of a, that Latin process of the sacred union coming together, being united, seeing that symbolically through Ursula. And in the other sort of Ursuline songs that she's she's looking so much about the the martyrdom of Ursula, the blood that was spilled as a commingling with that of Christ. I mean, this gets really, really symbolically deep. But here we're talking not about blood. We're talking about abundance and sweetness and delight and pleasure and closeness and all that is beautiful and good that is also so much so much related to our human senses so we have some really interesting work to do in this piece okay so so let me know if the sound is in any way jarring or not working for you but what we're going to do is we're going to go line by line now I Typically the way I teach this music is that I like to sing one line and then we would sing it together. If you feel comfortable singing it with me, that's great. But I just want to sort of get this in your ears and then we can go back and sing these larger sections together. Before we sing, I want you to just take a moment <clears throat> because something that's really crucial is that, especially as we approach a mystical subject via a mystical composer that it's very easy to let our eyes and our minds start to take over the doing of the song and i'm going to invite you to come into the heart into the body and see what happens when you can yoke the mind 
to the heart. Here we go. Have a listen. talking about this just this dripping honeycomb now with that image in mind allow that word favus to now be connected to an image now that you have the notes in the music give it an image try it one more time in this situation. Yes. Here's line two. Have a listen. Let's try that together. Ready? Urzula. as a whole concept, a whole idea. A dripping honeycomb was Ursula the Virgin. Okay. And then, when you feel like you have the space to do it, give it the image. Here we go. Here's the first two lines. Favus. Ready? So the translation in English is going to give you a slightly different sort of syntax because of the nature of the Latin sort of syntax versus English. It's just going to be a little bit flipped around. But the words are, Que anum dei, that the Lamb of God embraced, amplecti. I love how Hugh uses the word enfolded, enfolded, brought. In. <laughs> Here we go. Line three, have a listen and then we'll do it together. <laughs> Drops in the notation, and they're this sort of—it's sort of in inbuilt tension, and, and it's such a tense moment. How how interesting 
to think about that coming into with such tension, musical and sonorous tension, auditory tension. Let's go on, line four, the word desideravit, longed for, desired. Because we have something really fun here. With a B flat, have a listen. So I will say, if you're if you are wondering about the accidentals, anything that you see in the staff is going to be what was written in the manuscript. Anything that's above the staff is editorial. That is, I made a choice and put it in there based on the sort of visual arrangement of the manuscript, but honestly, what I'm hearing in my ear too. There's no treatise that tells us exactly how these are treated, alas. So what we just have is that the Lamb of God embraced and longed, longed for, desired. Let's put lines three and four together, and then we'll move forward a little bit more. Here's Kve, ready? And Kve. this last line of the first section line five have a listen honey and milk and see what this music resembles see what this resembles So here, let's try it together. Mel et lock, ready? Did anyone notice? Mel, here's Fabus. You hear this complementary musical material on the same sort of image. We have the honeycomb and the honey, honey that's tasted. Ah, love that. I love that. So, what we have here in this first response is the connection with the Song of Songs, this connection with our beloved, this understanding that this was Ursula and the Lamb of God coming together in this state of union. And how beautiful, how beautiful a thing that is. Then we talk in the Repetenda, the next section in uh, line six. Now the repetenda comes back a few times, in fact three times in every responsory. So here we have almost like a, a following, a, a following clause, because a fruit bearing garden and flores florum choicest flowers, but notice the alliteration flores florum or flowering flowers. In turba firginum, in a multitude of virgins, ad se collegit, to her were gathered. So we're saying that this image, this Ursula was this dripping honeycomb, and she longed to unfold the Lamb of God. Because 
what is what does she say as she also gathered these versions to her in the garden now another line in the song of songs just to sort of just flesh this out a little bit in the next in the next sort of section of of that song it says your branches are an orchard of pomegranate trees heavy with fruit um here we have this this fruit bearing garden that the virgins are are in the garden as well there's so much symbolic intent here and we're just scratching the surface and i just kind of want to give you these images as a as a jumping off point um i really i really love this section something to note you know as we as we come into this repetenda in line six look at you see how the notes are smaller the smaller versus the larger notes are indicating a weight versus um a relative weight stress versus unstressed um sort of dynamic versus more static or more fleshed out so when we hear or when we see rather the smaller notes that to me shows we've got some real movement going right into that and i love that because we're really getting into this next section with some sort of energetic movement. So let's sing this. Here's line six. Have a listen. <laughs> imagine a tree full of these pomegranates of the sweetest most sensual fruit line seven and flores florum the choicest blossoms that the flowers are the virgins this multitude of virgins offering sweet amazing gifts here we are ready have a listen or join in at Flores Florum. I love how meandering that is. Let's try it again. At Flores Florum. The next line, line eight. In Turba Virginum. Have a listen. In Turba Virginum. We saw that figure before, remember, in line three? Let's try that again. In again we're leaning right into this final word let's try line nine one more time all together ready here's line 10 you see this is all one word collegiate gathered gathered together just bringing all of these things together gathered that all 
all together once. This is line 10. This is a really amazing moment. <laughs> this melisma. Cool. anyone who's seeing any images or has any ideas about that melisma to just drop it in the chat. So something that we spoke about before when we were talking about the image of the honeycomb and bringing an image to the words and the really the act of singing. That you know bringing our mind into this this other realm, this imaginal realm, where we can actually connect with a symbol, an idea, an, uh, an archetype, something that we can sort of bring into this moment of, of the music that the music demands of us being in this moment. And so, you know, obviously we're learning and we're, we're experimenting and this is pure play. But it's very serious play. <laughs> so it's so interesting. It's so rich. I'd like to do the whole uh, repetenda together. Lines 6 through 10. And I'm going to give you an assignment, which is, as we're doing this together, how we can inform this with some kind of image. And I'm going to give that, I'm going to sort of toss the ball in your court, thinking about, you know, at the moment we're talking about bringing together this multitude of the virgins as a symbol of this sort of rich, abundant garden. That, you know, the lovers in the Song of Songs were frequently in this garden. <laughs> this is a place of utmost beauty and sacredness. And what does that look like to you? Not for Hildegard, not for Ursula, not for me, but for you. What is in that garden? What is in that garden? Here's line six. <clears throat> feels very different and believe it or not I believe it it makes me feel more connected to you when you bring something that is truly extraordinary that is outside of this everyday experience of you know coming on YouTube or Facebook or whatever or in my dining room <laughs> it's bringing the sacred into the commonplace through that intention and through that imaginal realm 
And that's the power of our own amazing consciousness. The next section is at line 11. Now, once we get through the first repetenda, we come to a verse. A verse that says, Unde in nobilissima aurora, therefore in the noblest dawn, gaude filia zion, rejoice daughter of Zion. Therefore in the noblest dawn. <clears throat> so we're saying rejoice in the most, he says, rejoice in the most exalted dawn, O daughter of Zion. So the daughter of Zion, we couple sort of things going on there. We we have the biblical reference. I wrote it down. Zechariah, I think. The book of Zechariah. Rejoice. You know, this sort of Handelian aria that we all know from Messiah sets this text. And here we have many layers of meaning there. But we also hear about the daughters of Zion in the Song of Songs, that the bride, the lover, the Shulamites, speaks to her sisters, the daughters of Zion. And I sort of see the layer of Ursula and her virgin companions too as the daughters of Zion, she being a daughter as well. We're all daughters in many ways. So here we have rejoicing in this exquisite dawn, whether that's the dawn of Ursula, whether that's the dawn of Christ and the bride coming together, or really the dawn in our own life. What's the dawn? What does that bring? So let's try this. Unde means therefore. It's very sort of statement-like. Have a listen or sing along, ready? I would breathe there. of that word. <laughs> I love it. Rejoice. Gaude. Let's try that again. Ready? Gaude. And we're going to go on. sort of musical settings there, which is unexpected, right? Let's try line 12 all together. Ready? Lines eleven and twelve together. Unde in nobilissima aurora gaude filia zion. So I'd like you to really take this sort of. I'm going to give you the image here, the aurora, the dawn. A dawn is the the sun rising. That something is arising within. That is resplendent with beauty possibility, potential, delight. And we can rejoice in it. We have permission to rejoice. Amen. Let's try it 11. Ready? 
sort of on the surface, but it actually arises from our own being. Amazing. Now we have the repetenda once more. You remember how this goes? <laughs> Let's try it. Here's line 13. section and that is the Gloria Patri or the doxology. Um, here in a liturgical context the doxology is this just it's a beautiful statement of praise and gratitude. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. So here we have very similar music. You'll hear this sort of overlaps here. Have a listen. Here's line 18. <clears throat> Doxology together. This is 18 and 19. And we'll bring it home. Spirit, please. 
attend it once more. So, we just went through all the music for this song. And it's, it is such a sound world. I mean, really. It's, uh, the, the evocations of images here are such, I, I'm going to use this metaphor, it's such a ripe garden for us. Creatively, artistically, significantly, however, ways, and I'm going to really invite you to just go one step further. As we, we think about, you know, we are performers or we are just partakers, but how are we part of the experience as well? Not only as passive sort of vehicles, but co-creators. This song doesn't exist without us right now. And it's so brilliant and it's so um, empowering to know that what we are able to bring through our intention and through that creative impulse of our own how we shape this experience for ourselves and for those around us. And it's, it's easy to forget that, you know, when you're learning a piece or when you're thinking about a million things, don't worry about it. <laughs> I think it's way more important to really, as we sort of want to really harvest the most from this music, it's to bring your own desires to the experience. There's your permission slip. Okay. My, um... <laughs> oh, my symphony is not working at all right now. <laughs> okay, we're not going to use that. I'm sorry. But I do want to do the whole song. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can say that we did. I'm sorry, baby. Sometimes that's just the bridge. Awkwardly seated. Or maybe it just doesn't like the, the humidity today. Okay. Ready? We need to come into that image of the honeycomb. Ursula, the bridegroom, the garden, the smell of the air, the taste on your lips, the feel of your, your physical body, all opportunities. Here we go. Ready? Here's the top.
Satan da. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. So, <clears throat> I, I treasure this time to offer these thoughts and these ideas, and I entreat you to go forth and really sort of let this sort of ruminatio continue. Um, this event is just kind of a soft launch into the season. There's been so much change and transformation in this past year, so there's some really, really beautiful things that are coming up for Aya, opportunities to, to get involved, um, both in, in this context and also in a more uh, personalized, one face-to-face -to -face context. Um, there is a class if you're interested in going deeper into the music and the sort of archetypal psychological aspects of this music and its capacity for personal transformation, that class begins, uh, it's called Hildegard's Muse and it begins on November 4th and it's uh, on Zoom and I'll be leading that class and it's a wonderful way to go even deeper into these songs devoted to Ursula. Yes, Monica, I completely agree. The Wandering. That's beautiful. Um, for those of you who don't see this comment, Monica says, I love how the word collegit sounds like wandering around the garden, collecting food to gather the virgins or the virgins wandering into and around the garden. Yes. And possibly also another layer is their actual pilgrimage, this sort of wandering towards the sacred sites. Um, fascinating, yeah, good observation. So I invite you to keep in touch. Um, you can learn more about the class on AIA's website. You can also download more scores. Um, these are free and the whole purpose is that it makes this music as accessible as possible. I'm really serious about that. And my ultimate goal is to creatively empower you and to bring in this sort of deeper and more prominent aspect of the feminine and the way in which we're engaging with music. So my friends, have a beautiful rest of the day. Thank you for watching. If you were here live, thank you. And um, it's my great honor and pleasure to be here with you, to share this with you. So thank you. Take care. <laughs>